into our uh, worship service. Uh, I just want to give you a few notes before we begin the service. Is my microphone coming through all right? All right, let me hear. It works better if I turn it on, so sorry about that. Um, there are just a few things I want to note. Uh, first off, that um, uh, at the end of the service, um, we're finishing with the, the procession of bringing the cross forward. Uh, and then uh, after that, uh, and we'll be some singing going along with that. After that, uh, it's a, a time of healing. And this is, the stations of healing are listed here, uh, but they're also here in this room. Uh, you are invited, if you'd like to come to the railings to pray. And uh, as pastors, we'll be there to pray for uh, anything you want like in your life. And then we'll also have uh, anointing with oil, uh, so you're invited for that. Uh, you're asked to lay your burdens on the cross, and uh, we'll have the cross up here, and the, and the basket are rocks. Uh, and uh, you can either come straight forward right up here, uh, but there's also a beautiful ramp right by here that might be easier than the stairs, so uh, either way is fine. Uh, and then over here, you can tell all during Lent, we have been tying onto the cross our prayers, and uh, it's gone from just a, a barren looking vine uh, to look like spring. So you can add some of your prayers to that as well. And then over here uh, by the baptismal font, uh, we have a lighting of candles. During all that, uh, we're going to be doing something that's really a very ancient sung prayer. It's called the Solemn Reproaches. Uh, Jerry will be singing uh, our way through that. Uh, and the words are very uh, meaningful uh, and powerful. And there is a response uh, that you are invited to join in the sing. Um, you, can, you can do that from where you're sitting. You can move around uh, and do the other things and still join in on the responses as you see fit. Uh, and then at the end of the service, we're going to uh, end one more time as we began in silence. Uh, there'll be a little bit of time here where we'll keep the sanctuary quiet for those who want to continue to pray. But I, I do ask, uh, we could use about five or six people uh, that could stay around afterwards. This would be a very barren setup for Easter morning. Uh, we want to put the altar and the pulpit back in. Uh, so if you can stick around a little bit afterwards and help us to reset the sanctuary, um, you, even if you can't lift heavy things, you might be able to point at us and say, no, a little bit more to the left. Uh, so uh, we'd love to have your help. So thank you very much. Let's uh, prepare our hearts now for this beautiful worship time.
Merciful God, your Son was lifted up on the cross to draw all people to himself. Grant that we who have been born out of his wounded side may at all times find mercy in him. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked, Whom are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked, Whom are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he. So if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the temple police arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Let's take a moment of prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, help us to see our way through of this remembrance of what you gave for us and help us to see ourselves in this story, even though it's hard to see. In your holy name we pray, amen. amen. I don't know the history. I don't know how many generations back, uh, but I remember from my childhood coming to a Holy Week service, and uh, together as a congregation, we would read through, uh, and there would always be a narrator, and there would always be a Jesus, and a Peter, and a Pilate, uh, and other voices. But 
what jumped out to me uh, was that um, in the middle of that uh, would be lines that the congregation would read. Uh, and what really struck out to me uh, was that we, as a congregation, got to play the bad guy. Now, uh, you know, as a child, that's kind of fun. You know, you can draw a little curly mustache, you know, uh, and uh, pretend like you're the, the, the person that everyone's scared of. And so I was kind of extra excited that we got to do that at church of all places. Um, but uh, there was a strange feeling, a strange feeling of having those words come out of my mouth, spoken to Jesus, uh, the one I prayed to before I went to bed at night. Let's look, uh, uh, we'll peek ahead to the next page. If you want to turn over in your bulletin, you'll see that on those two pages there, uh, there are several times uh, when the crowd speaks. Uh, and each time the crowd speaks, unfortunately, it sounds like things that are often part of our own lives, things that maybe we don't necessarily feel really so good about. The first time uh, that we will speak tonight, we will say, not this man, but Barabbas. That's a choice. The people are making a choice. And the choice is not to choose Jesus. I've never had it that dramatically in my life. But if I am honest, there are many, many times when there has been a choice between me choosing Jesus and something else in my life. And I have not chosen Jesus. There are many times, especially when I'm going along with the crowd, that I don't choose Jesus. And I know this crowd's voice is my voice. The next time we hear the, the very angry words, crucify him, crucify him. I think we all know what it's like to have that kind of anger that kind of anger to want something to go away. And sometimes in that anger, even when we somehow feel it's righteous, we discover that we are in fact yelling against God, directing our anger at the one that loves us the most. After that, we have this word. We have a law and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the son of God. Sometimes when we join in this kind of speech, what we do is try desperately to sound reasonable. And just like these people, there is a lot of self-justification going on. These are the rules and we're only following them. The next one is a little bit more subtle or maybe it isn't. If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself up against the emperor. Do you recognize that one? We are many and we are a crowd and we are threatening you. You know, in this story, it looks and he somewhat acts like as if Pontius Pilate holds all the power as if Pontius Pilate has everything going and can decide the fate of Jesus. But that's not true in the Gospel of John. He is the one who is scared. He is scared by the crowd and he acquiesces. The last one, away with him, away with him, crucify him. These are the words of condemnation. These are the words where we make ourselves the judge over others and over God. As I said, I don't know how many years uh, the people have been doing this of reading the story together and the congregation taking the part of the crowd. 
But the idea behind it goes back to the very first sermon that was ever preached to the church. The very first sermon really preached to the church was Peter preaching on Pentecost. And there was a crowd of people that were standing before him. And he said to that crowd in Acts chapter 2, You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power and wonders and signs that God did through him among you. As you yourself know, this man handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed. You crucified and killed. It's very strange because you think he would have blamed the Romans after it was all the Roman soldiers who set the cross up. It was the Roman soldiers who swung the hammer. But Peter takes that guilt into himself and he knows the real reasons why Jesus died. And it had nothing to do with the violence of an occupying force. What Jesus did, he did for the people of God who had become an angry crowd. So when Peter tells the crowd of their guilt and responsibility, he is calling them out. He is calling them out. And here's the strange thing. That's exactly what church literally means the ones who have been called out. The ones who have called out. We're called out from our guilt and we're gifted with the Holy Spirit. And we follow Christ even though at times our lives work against him. We follow Christ and we become the called out ones. But nights like tonight, are a good reality check. Because while we may be the ones who have been called out, we also never stop being the crowd. And tonight we remember that Jesus died because the crowd's voice is our voice as well. Amen. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jewish people come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face. Is that how you answer the high priest? If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, 
You are not also one of his disciples, are you? I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? I tell you, I am not. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be unable to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jewish authorities replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish authorities. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. So you are a king. You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this... I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? The crowd shouted in reply, Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look. I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the temple police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The crowd answered, 
Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the crowd cried out, If you release this man, you are no threat to the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the crowd, Here is your king. The crowd cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Judeans read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the temple said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am king of the Jews. What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Oh, sorry. Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. 
When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then Jesus said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jewish authorities did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage, passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jewish authorities, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid, and so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there.
Let us pray. Lord God, from us you have withheld nothing, not even your only Son. With humble hearts we give you thanks for this, the greatest gift. In grateful response we commend ourselves to you. Be pleased, O Lord, to accept all that we offer you. Look upon the intentions of our hearts. Hear our prayers, O God, and respond according to your will and for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. the life-giving cross on which was hung the Savior of the world. Oh, come, let us worship Behold the life-giving cross on which was hung the Savior of the world. Oh, come, let us worship Behold the life-giving cross on which was hung the Savior of the world. Oh, come, let us worship Him.
my people, O oh my church, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. I led you out of slavery into freedom and delivered you through the waters of rebirth. But you have prepared a cross for your Savior. I led you through the desert, feeding you with manna on the way. I saved you from the time of trial and gave you my body, the bread of heaven. But you have prepared a cross for your Savior. you on your way in a pillar of cloud and fire, but you led me to the judgment hall of Pilate. I guided you with the light of the Holy Spirit, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. As my fairest vine, but you have brought forth bitter fruit. I made you branches of the vine and never left your side, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. people, O oh my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I poured out saving water from the rock, but you gave me vinegar to drink. I poured out my life and gave you the new covenant in my blood, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. my people, O oh my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I gave you a royal scepter, but you gave me a crown of thorns. I gave you the kingdom and crowned you with eternal life, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. I struck down your enemies, but you struck my head with a reed. 
I gave you my peace, but you draw the sword in my name. And you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, I open the waters to lead you to the promised land, but you opened my side with a spear. I washed your feet as a sign of my love, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, immortal have mercy on us. O oh, my ch people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I lifted you up to the heights, but you lifted me high on a cross. I erased you from death and prepared you for the tree of life. But you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, my people, O oh my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I grafted you into my people, Israel, but you made them scapegoats for your own guilt, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. I came to you in the least of your brothers and sisters, but I was hungry and you gave me no food. Thirsty and you gave me no drink, a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. By your holy cross you have redeemed the 